Beginning transmission. This is the Chaos Community Broadcast, a show about failures and how to navigate complex socio-technical systems so you can surf the chaos instead of succumbing to it. For a recording of this broadcast, as well as all of our previous broadcasts, go to the web browser of your choice and type in chaos.community. Well, I'm your host, James Wickett. And I'm your redundant host, Casey Rosenthal. Well, today we are continuing our series uh, on the book, Chaos Engineering, System Resiliency in Practice. We have with us today, one of the contributing authors of the book, uh, uh, and we're really excited about this. It's Dr. Peter Alvaro. I mean, just uh, you just go by Peter, but he is a doctor who wrote the chapter, The Experiment Selection Problem. Now, you may know him from his work as an assistant professor of CompSci at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he leads the Disorderly Labs, uh, which is a research group that works on techniques to reason about data intensive uh, distributed systems. He has his PhD from UC Berkeley. And, uh, you know, Dr. Alvaro, Peter, we're really excited to have you on the show. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Well, uh, Peter, uh, first, uh, congratulations on uh, being published in this book. I don't know if you've ever written anything before, but I, I read your chapter. And it, was, it was quite good. So congrats on that. Thank you. One of the things that I, I really admire about your journey is that you worked at asks.com um, and you had the sense and fortitude uh, to leave in an impersonal, uh, faceless, amoral corporation and move into academia. Um, you're now at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, so, you know, you've left behind uh, politics. There's no more deadlines, material concerns. Um, what's it like teaching uh, at the beacon on the sand dune? Uh, is professorship um, what we all imagine? You know, the, the fancy cars, drinks with paper umbrellas, Patagonia vests? It's a, it's a great question, and I appreciate... Um... I appreciate the playful spirit of it. So I think as you know, and I think as everyone knows, it doesn't get much more political than academia and people pick the pettiest battles. Despite that, it's my dream job. It's everything I ever wanted. I, I, I wasn't meant to work at a corporation, although it took a long time for that to sort of dawn on me. Um, balancing my time between mentorship researching things that I'm choosing to work on, not because there's a quarterly deadline associated with it, but because I've selected the problem the, <laughs> as, as, as something that's difficult and fun and providing service, volunteer service to the community. These are sort of the three pillars of academia. And this is like, this is the way that I want to live. It is true that it's not lost on me that I could be making three times as much and working one third as hard just over the hill. Um, but, but having this kind of level of agency is something that I always wanted, but I didn't know how important it was to me until I actually got it. So uh, I've, I've never uh, taught anyone anything. Um, I don't really know how, you know, how teaching humans works. Um, I pride myself on being uh, selfish taught. Um, that's, a, that's a phrase I learned from Ayn Rand when we were on a panel together, competitive shrugging. Um, do you ever come across a student and think, you know what, this one is just unteachable. I should do society a, fa a favor and just like, you know, flunk this person out. Does that ever happen? Or That's a really interesting question. I mean, I think I'm going to answer this question very honestly, which is that um, despite my dedication to teaching, because of the impaction of the major, the, the bare size of the classes, I don't frequently find myself um, agonizing over individual students. I end up having to do a lot of stuff in aggregate. Now, that's not to say that I don't have personal relationships with students, but it's the kind of thing where, for example, the last class I taught, there were 400 students enrolled. So I got to know a few of them, those who attended office hours quite well. There was certainly a significant number of students who did not pass the class. You know, it was a difficult systems programming class. I, as much as I'd like to pass everybody, I can't pass people who don't learn the material. But I'm glad I've never had to think. Like, I like to think I would never think that thing that you just said. Uh, so at, at uh, Disorderly Labs, which is your, your research uh, uh, lab there, you're doing research on lineage-driven uh, fault injection. Can you explain to the audience a little bit about what LDFI is and, and give us a, you know, a taste of, of that research? I believe there are, there, are, there are three research topics that you focus on, and that's one of them. Yeah, and it's sort of, um, 
up through tenure, which as I said, is kind of just wrapping up now. It was my flagship project. It was the project that was supported by my career award from the National Science Foundation. And so it was the thing that I really had a lot to prove during my first few years as a professor. Uh, when people, you know, as you may know, during my PhD at UC Berkeley, I was very focused on languages, language design, and uh, uh, patterns for consistent by construction distributed systems. And then when I got to Santa Cruz, I realized I, I should do some work uh, to, to, to the best of my ability to differentiate my work from that of my research team and my advisor. Um, and so LDFI kind of became like my flagship pro project, but it very much did come out of that thesis work. I developed LDFI during my last year and a half at UC Berkeley with my advisor, Joe Hellerstein, and my colleague, Josh Rosen, who's now at, at Datastax, uh, excuse me, um, Databricks. Uh, and the basic idea, like much of my work, what we were doing was we were taking database systems theory, and instead of using it to build or understand a database, we were sort of transplanting it to the domain of distributed systems and seeing whether database systems theory could make distributed systems easier to program, and in this case, easier to understand. And the tool that we dusted off was this idea of provenance. A provenance enhanced system, database system, operating system, etc., as it does computation, writes on the side how the computation happened. So after a computation terminates, you can obtain a provenance graph, which is essentially a, a fine-grained explanation of the data that was combined to produce that outcome and the computational steps that were taken to do it. So provenance comes from you know, the art world. I'd like to know the chain of custody of this Picasso or Rembrandt painting so that I, I, I believe that it's not a fake. But you can imagine getting a query result from a database or even running a program in a large scale system and it terminates correctly and you say, okay, how did you correctly terminate? So it's a graphical explanation of the steps that were taken, the computers, for example, that needed to cooperate, the messages that were exchanged and the order in which they were exchanged, the messages that weren't exchanged due to a message loss or something like this. So the idea was, you know, you may not be able to completely understand your program and figure out if it has any bugs, but you can look at these sort of witnesses of its execution, these traces, these provenance graphs, and you can begin to build a model of how it does what it does. Now in a distributed system, what's the most important thing that a system does? A system provides some modicum of redundancy. Right? I put my baby photos on more than one computer so that I can tolerate the loss of them. Sometimes I send a message multiple times in case it doesn't get there on the first try. Right? If you sort of squint your eyes and, and view distributed systems from 30,000 feet up, fault tolerance mechanisms, be they retry, replication, error correcting codes, multiple data center deployments, etc., they all have this flavor of I've done something more than once or I put something in more than one place to tolerate loss. So the idea of linear driven fault injection was is this iterative process where you passively watch the system for a while and build a model. And then you, you perturb the system by injecting faults. You want to inject faults that sort of, if you like, uh, in a dark region of the model that you don't have any evidence of what the system does in those contingencies. Now I inject a fault and one of two things could happen that fault could cause the system to violate one of its correctness properties. So now an, an integration test fails or something like that, right? If that happens, I should stop testing and fix the bug. But if the, if the fault injection test doesn't reveal a bug, what does it reveal? Well, it's given me another provenance graph. What is that provenance graph? Well, that provenance graph is an explanation of how my system worked around that particular fault. Now, Presumably, there's lots of symmetry in a system like this. There's lots of other faults that are similar to that one. Maybe I shouldn't carry out those experiments right now because I have evidence of how the system tolerates that kind of fault. I should choose another area of the system. How easy is it to generalize that model? So uh, for example, imagine you have a complex uh, physical system like, like a bank uh, and imagine you're trying to get money uh, out of the bank and you know how many tellers there are uh, what the layout of the office is, where the alarms are the model of the safe where the guards are now imagine you can simulate ways in which you can make an error in retrieving all the money from the bank could you use ldfi in a scenario like this to quickly identify all the ways in which your extraction could fail and use that knowledge to build a, a redundant foolproof method to extract the money successfully every time Oh, so that is so interesting. I certainly haven't ever thought about it before, but why, why couldn't you do that sort of thing, right? Why couldn't you do the complement of, uh, of LDFI and think of LDFI? And so 
I don't know if you've ever, if you've read the original Sigmod paper, but in the original Sigmod paper, I do characterize fault injection as, uh, by analogy, as, as sort of a game that you're playing with an adversary, right? So the, the protocol developer is trying to add redundancy, and the adversary is trying to find places where they missed a spot. And you can imagine this iterative process, where as you reveal more redundancy, you know, um, I haven't ever thought about using a technology like this to help you commit a crime. Is that what we're saying here? I, we're gonna we're gonna edit this part. We're gonna edit this part out, guys. Let me uh, let me just focus in on on uh, one of your um, one of the things you posit in there, which is that uh, failure. Uh, I'm sorry, success of, of of a trace in the presence of failure implies a redundancy to to get to the the correct assertion. When you define redundancy that way, it makes sense to me. Um, I'm just uh, I'm curious how you see redundancy in general, uh, uh, because you know, for example, it's one of the things that we highlight as a, a myth of reliability that if you add redundancy, you're going to make your system more reliable. When in fact, we we have a lot of uh, evidence that adding redundancy often uh, is a contributing factor to a complex system uh, failing. Now, it might not be in the strictly formal sense that you that 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 you mean here. Um, but certainly there's, there's some, you know, I, I think this is an area that deserves more research because we don't quite have a, a strong correlation between the types of redundancy that contribute to reliability versus those that inadvertently contribute to uh, uh, incidents, to a lack, to a vulnerability. Well, I mean, you make it sound like you're dichotomizing and, and that doesn't feel quite right to me. I mean, I think it goes without saying that redundancy mechanisms increase the complexity of a piece of software. And when you increase the complexity of the piece of software, cognition, interpretability get harder. And I think that's fundamental. But I would be, I would be more inclined to characterize it as a trade-off, right? Like, um, so I, I teach a, a systems programming class, and you know, we, we spent a lot of time this year on the concept of fate sharing, right? Uh, the idea that you know, if, if, if you know, if we're sharing fate, if one of us dies, we both die. That seems bad. Actually, it's good. Okay, we need to we need to take a break uh, for our sponsor. Uh, this cures headaches and indigestion. It's the effervescent brain salt. This is a positive relief and cure for brain troubles, headaches, seasickness, nervous debility, sleeplessness, uh, excessive study mania, and over brain work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, this has been uh, this has been trademarked and registered by F. Newberry and Sons. And if you would like information, it's one and third King Edward Street in uh, London, and you can contact them there. Thank you. That's something. Uh, so if, if, uh, if viewers want to donate to Disorderly Labs, uh, do you have a GoFundMe set up or something like that? I, I don't because I don't think we're actually allowed to accept donations uh, in that way. But if you are interested in supporting my research, come talk to me. You'd be in good company. In, in your paper, abstracting the genius, uh, geniuses away from uh, failure testing uh, published in the communication of the a a ACM in uh, 2018, uh, you write, existing uh, failure testing solutions require skilled and intelligent users, which, you know, sounds like a compliment, who can supply the faults to inject. Uh, these super users, known as chaos engineers and, and Jepson experts, must study the system under test, observe system executions, and then formulate hypotheses about which faults are most likely to expose real system design flaws. This approach is fundamentally unscalable and unprincipled. Um, unprincipled. Uh, and then later on, you call us uh, the old gods. So I'm getting mixed messages here. Uh, are we chaos engineers, gods, intelligent, old, unprincipled? Are we the baddies? <laughs> um, okay, so let me, uh, okay, unprincipled. Important to remember that, um, that that paper is a polemic piece. It's using direct argumentation rather than evidence or whatever. And so, and so overclaiming is not the right word, but it, so it, we, you know, we're coming in strong in, in that paper, um, trying to get people's attention. And the hope is that, as, and this is a style I do all the time actually in research, is like a little bit of overclaiming in the abstract or introduction so that principled readers will go, oh, I'll believe that when I see it, and then actually read the paper. You know, As I get into in my chapter, expert level SREs are essential. 
but it's very hard to characterize. Like, certainly they have some mental model of the system that they occasionally discharge intuitions from, and that mental model surely was built up by being around, having experience, watching the system. But it's very hard in general for them to train, or even for that matter, explain the process. I know this for a fact. I've spent the last couple of years interviewing SREs at big companies and saying, okay, tell me, walk me through these incidents. Like, what do you do first? Then what do you do? Um, and so like, I don't think it's totally unfair to characterize the process that is applied in incident response and in, you know, experiment selection as you've read Plato's IO, right? Like a God speaks through me, like a, a, a creative effort, right? You spend a lot of time on the beach. Which coast is the best coach coast? It's the, the left coast is the best coast. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the thing is, it's unfortunate that the water's awfully cold. I wish there was something that could be done about that. Have you, have you been up to Maine? I've never been to Maine. So Maine actually has more coastline than the entire west coast of the United States. Um, because of some Mandelbrot kind of situation. Yeah, because it goes in and out. And in fact, um, when we um, when we were first mapping it um, back in the uh, in the in the twenties in the seventeen twenties, um, what was his name? Joseph Heath and I. Uh, you know, it was it was just a, our maps back then were just uh, a disaster. Of course, um, you probably wouldn't recognize them anyway. But like we back then, you didn't orient maps with north being up, um, so they were they were kind of hard to to place anyway, which. I'll just say, you know, for the record, I think is a mistake. North is is a Western European uh, uh, arbitrary uh, uh, designation, um, and, and I hope you both agree that um, East should be up on a map. We have, uh, yeah, we have. Um, if nothing else, we have a natural precedence, and you know, bees when they do their dance, they designate uh, up as East. Very interesting. Uh, but there is no eastmost place on earth, unfortunately. So, In the book, you mentioned intuition engineering. Is, um, is intuition engineering the best idea I've ever had? I mean, uh, can, can I answer the question honestly? I think the chaos community is the best idea you've ever had. But I think the intuition engineering work is like, it's very compellingly argued. That's why I dug into it and fought with it so much. You know, it's like, as I think I, I think I indicate in the book, like everything you say in that blog post is true. I, I, I just think it's a catastrophically wrong way to look at the problem. Uh, do, do we have any calls? This is usually the, the live call. We do, we do have a couple just call in. So I'm going to play those uh, for you. My name is Bartholomew, longtime listener, first time caller. Peter, in your 2017 HPTS talk on Molly and Daedalus, you proclaimed that LDFI would, quote, usher in a revolution, and put the experts out of a job through, quote, aggressive unification. How many distributed systems experts has LDFI maimed or killed to date? And how do you propose we put their mangled bodies to good use? Uh, so, you know, I made this joke a couple weeks ago about how um, the, the, the coronavirus has made everything so hard for grad students because once upon a time when you gave a conference talk, it was this like 15 minute ephemeral thing with 40 people in the room, no recording, and you could pretty much say anything you wanted because there was no real record of what you did. So you kind of just got out there and said whatever it took to get people's attention, create controversy. And so this is, uh, I assume that that was Kyle Kingsbury and I deserve this. I have this coming. Uh, and yeah, I mean, what can I, what can I say? Uh, I went out there with a lot of bluster and I, I, I think that this is a true statement. I, it was never my intention to harm anyone or to put anyone out of a job. Rather, it was my intention to get everyone's attention. And I think I succeeded. Let's, yeah, let's, let's, we got one more, one more caller. Uh, let's move over to that other caller right now. This is Douglas Overton Fournier from the University of Oxford. I recently received a letter from UCSF's Tenure Review Board asking some troubling questions about Professor Alvaro's candidacy, and I was just hoping that he might be able to clear those up. Professor, is it true that in your recent submissions to Sigmod and Pod C, you've listed Wilder Ranch State Park as your institutional affiliation, and listed a pod of sea lions, seven sand dollars, 
and the sound of the wind through my daughter's hair as potential conflicts of interest. <laughs> Awaiting your response. <gasps> so, as, as you may know, when you go up for tenure, in addition to like looking at your publication count and deciding if you're a nice boy, they send out letters to some number, maybe 10 well-known people in your area, usually at more prestigious institutions. Typically, you're allowed to supply two or three of those names that they fill out to eight or 10. So there's a lot of stress around, God, I hope, I hope that they don't send, you know, send, write to some old database people from Oxford and they're like, Peter who? Or whatever. Like, I, I'm, I'm losing a lot of sleep about it, honestly. And, and I've curated very carefully that set of people who I, uh, who I want to recommend. Um, the fact that my work has been interdisciplinary makes this harder because I sort of pattern match as a database person, but I don't publish in database venues very much and, and so on and so forth. So this, I feel this, uh, this gets under my skin. Um, uh, but, but yeah, like, like a huge part of my identity is the coast. And I have meetings with my students at the beach and um, lifestyle. Oh man, so this one time I was at a Sigmod in Melbourne presenting LDFI and this guy, I won't say who it was, I'm wearing my UCSC sweatshirt. And he said, what's with the sweatshirt? I said, oh, I accepted a position at UCSC. Now I had also been, um, I had some other offers, right? So, but, and he said to me, oh, UCSC, that's a lifestyle choice. And I was kind of like, my first thought was, fuck you, dude. Like, who do you think you are? What a, sh what a lousy thing to say. I apologize for the, for the language. And then my second thought was, okay, well, this guy's a jerk, right? But it was a lifestyle choice. And in fact, looking back over my entire life, I can't think of any choices I've ever made that weren't lifestyle choices. Like, like my dream job is teaching service and research very close to the Pacific coast. And I'm not ashamed. And if that keeps me from getting tenure, you know, like whatever. <laughs> that concludes our show. Thanks for joining us today. If you're looking for a recording of this broadcast or others, uh, go to chaos.community in the web browser of your choice. And we are ending transmission now.